Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. There is so much fabulous, inventive science fiction in Showtime's sequel to the classic 1976 David Bowie film, The Man Who Fell to Earth. But guess what? Earth humans are already making the planet-saving energy source the alien Faraday brings with him from Anthea, sort of. Dr. Arturo Dominguez of the Princeton Plasma Lab is here to explain. Dr. Dominguez, so glad you could join us. Thank you for having me. Every once in a while on this show, we find current science fiction that is actually behind current science fact. And in The Man Who Fell to Earth, it's a big deal that Justin Falls was once able to create nuclear fusion for just a few seconds. How normal is that now? Oh, we create fusion in our labs almost every day when we're running. And in the fiction, the aliens seek the help of the scientist Justin Falls because her MIT dissertation theorized the possibility of fusing atomic nuclei by combining magnetic field containment with plasma, like it was a groundbreaking idea. Did current fusion scientists worldwide go, duh, of course we use a magnetic containment field to fuse the plasma? We've actually known that we can control plasmas with magnetic fields for more than a century, so yes. When writers Jenny Lament and Alex Kurtzman create a show, they do their science homework mostly. And in The Man Who Fell to Earth, the characters throw around the terms cold fusion while avoiding the term nuclear fusion, possibly to sidestep any association with nuclear fission. But I got a guy who knows what's what here. So what's the difference between nuclear fission uh -huh. and nuclear fusion? <laughs> so, so yeah, so I like the, the this and this, and that you have it, right? That's the, that's the answer. For fission, you get big nuclei like uranium and you break it apart and release energy that way. For fusion, you get smaller nuclei, put them together and release energy that way. What ends up happening is that if you were to, to weigh them before and after the reaction, it would weigh a little bit less. And that mass via Einstein's famous E equals MC squared, turns into energy. Oh. And at a microscopic level, the energy is just kinetic energy of the byproducts just flying out. That's the energy produced. It's that the nucleus loses a little bit of mass and turns into kinetic energy. Cold fusion, is that like the science lab equivalent of buying the Brooklyn Bridge from Charles <laughs> Ponte? That just... so, so let's step back as I go. So fusion is putting two nuclei together. Why is that hard? Because they're both positively charged. And so the positive charges don't want to get together. Then the most common ways that we try to get to fusion is making plasma super, super, super hot so that every once in a while, the nuclei get together. For cold fusion, or how they now call it, low energy nuclear reactions, Lenner, uh, I think to get away from the stigma of cold fusion. Um, the, the basic idea is that that you could do it at much lower temperatures than the really hot ones that we need for, for thermonuclear fusion. This was actually theorized that there was a possibility that something like this could happen. And in the 80s, they came out with some experiments that they claimed to release some energy. But what happened? When they tried to reproduce those experiments, you couldn't get the results reproduced. So in science, if you can't reproduce an experiment, you don't have anything, right? And on top of that, the science, the, the physics required for the, at those low temperatures to create fusion isn't really there. You really require much higher energies for fusion. So not only was the theory not there, but also you couldn't reproduce the results. Now, this is still an ongoing field. There is actual research dollars going into it because it would be amazing if we could get fusion energy out of cold fusion. But we haven't gotten to reproducible results that you could say. So when you say the, the, the physics isn't there, do yeah. you mean that the naturally occurring physics is not there or that the physics research is not there? Gotcha, yes. The, um, well, I, let me rephrase it as our understanding of physics does not explain what happens in cold fusion, in what they claim to be happening. That's what I would say. Yeah. I think it can sometimes be hard for lay audiences to understand the idea that science, which is all about facts and actualities and realities, can have this moment where they say, but maybe. Yeah, we're always but maybeing. Because really, 
even with theory, like even if we did have, uh, even if we couldn't prove it in theory that it could occur, but then you went to an experiment and you got energy in the grid, then what we say is we're wrong. I mean, the theorists are wrong. It's always the experiment is the one that that is right, right? So we're always in a maybe. We're always in a, we believe the science is this, but if the next paper comes along and disproves it and you get repeated right. uh, facts, then we've got to, real, we, we've got to redo our, our theory. Well, that's what happened with Einstein at the beginning of the century. What he proposed was completely counter to the theory at the moment, but the experiments, the, the eclipse experiment, all these things led to he was actually right. And while it may distress people like me who don't really understand science, it's actually the best thing about science it that is. we can have okay. the next thing. But so cold fusion is out. Cold fusion is out, at least for the moment. So how much heat does it take to create fusion energy? The temperatures that we deal with are about the temperature of the center of the sun, 10 million degrees, which Sounds like it is a lot, it is a lot. <laughs> but we can control, we can do that almost every day in, in a fusion reactor. Um, but again, to get to, to the point in which we get more energy out than in, when we actually can create the conditions for ignition for a power plant, we believe that we need, in a magnetic confinement device, we believe that we need about 10 times hotter than the center of the sun about 150 million degrees. 10 times hotter. Than hotter, yes, yep. Why, what's and wrong with the sun? The sun is it. so hot. <laughs> That's why, a good question. Why? Yes, yeah, why, why can't we just do it at if the temperature If it's happening in the sun, in the sun why yes. can't it happen in the lab? That is a very valid question. The reason is, I know this sounds weird, but per cubic meter, yeah. The sun is a super inefficient reactor. We need much more bang for our buck. So we actually don't use protons. We use, or, or hydrogen, normal hydrogen, we use what are called isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. I'm so glad you mentioned those radioactive isotopes because in episode five, the alien Faraday is literally beside himself searching desperately for a radioactive isotope of hydrogen called tritium. Here in the real world, I called up a company called Glow Rhino and they sent me these very fabulous glowing fobs of tritium that I kind of love, but I'm gonna give you one to take home. Awesome. So, but Arturo, what is tritium? First of all, you should have told Faraday about the company. <laughs> um, tritium is, a, th thank you so much. It's an isotope of hydrogen. What does that mean? So in the nucleus, there's protons, which are positive, and neutrons, which are neutral. For something to be hydrogen, it just says that it has a proton in the middle. It says nothing about the neutrons, just that there's one proton. So you have a, a single proton in the middle. If it has no neutrons, it's the normal hydrogen. If it has one neutron, it's deuterium. And it, if, if it has two neutrons, so one proton and two neutrons, it's tritium. So, but it has the, the same electrical properties as hydrogen, but different nuclear properties because of the neutron. So are these, are these isotopes useful because they're not stable? So no, uh, and by the way, deuterium is pretty stable. Tritium is the one that's a little bit unstable. That's why tritium is the one that's hard to get because the, the inside of this, the tritium that'll, that's here, it'll be half gone in 12 years and then, a, and then uh, three quarters gone in, in 25 years. It has a half-life of 12 years. I was told it would glow for 26 years. There you go. So it'll glow until it's about a quarter full. So, but your original question is, is why do we use deuterium and tritium versus, the, versus uh, hydrogen, which is much more abundant? And the reason is because of those nuclear properties. When you deal with the nuclear reactions, the, the, the type of isotopes is different. So what I just said, deuterium and tritium gives you more bang for your buck is because of the differences of their nuclei. All right, so let's dish about <laughs> let's 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 dish about the neutron love child, the the, the tritium deuterium smash. <laughs> tritium deuterium smash. What? Yes. They smash. Uh huh. And they have a they have a, a love child. Yeah. Love yeah, child. Love child. Yeah, okay. By the way, so they they smash. They create uh, an unstable helium five. That means it's helium. That means it has two protons, and five because it has five little nucleons and all. Two protons and three neutrons. So again, let's let's try to make the, the 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 little image in our head. Tritium, deuterium, they get together, 
and they move their nucleons around and they explode out into a helium atom with two and two and a neutron coming out. Okay. So when you look at the math, it's three neutrons coming out in, three neutrons coming out, two protons coming in, two protons coming out, but they're rearranged. And just that rearrangement releases energy. It's the change that causes the energy because of, because of Einstein. Yes, it's the little change in mass that causes them to get out at thousands of times more energy than the energy that was required to put. Remember, you, you have to get them pretty energetically for them to combine in the first place because they're positive. Because they don't, because they don't they want to combine. But, but if you were to get them to, so they're very energetic, but if you get them to combine, when they fly apart, they've got thousands of times more energy than the energy that was required to get them together. So that's the energy that we want to harness when we're doing fusion. Alchemists toiled for generations trying to transmute base metals into gold. And in the 1980s, Nobel Prize winner Glenn Seaborg used a particle accelerator to remove two protons and neutrons from the lead-like element bismuth to make gold at a cost immeasurably more expensive than the gold produced. In real life, what's the current energy in, energy out, batting average of, of nuclear fusion? Okay, that's a good question. So, so. Uh, magnetic fusion was winning uh, until recently. We had uh, the joint European Taurus jet had gotten to about 0.68 or something, which, it, which means that this was in, in a single shot for every watt of power that came in, for the megajoule of power that came in, you got 0.68 in a, in a single reaction, right? So that, yeah, so that was the record. In August of last year, actually, uh, NIF, the National Ignition Facility in Lawrence Livermore, using not magnets but lasers to get a little pellet and compress it dramatically. So the, the amount of laser energy that was put into the, the little device that, that compresses the pellet was about 1.9 megajoules and the energy released was 1.3, which is a Q of 0.7. For initial confinement fusion, which is this type of fusion, it was by far the record shot. So the, the NIF, that this National Ignition Facility, where the actual machine is, is in Star Trek, where the control room is. They filmed it in that facility. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> it's amazing. But we think we're gonna get past the Q equals one, which is more energy out than in, really very soon. When lasers, you say like a column, a columnated beam of light can make this happen, right? Is that yeah. what we're, that's, yeah. that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not, it's many columnated beams Still. of light that all compress a, a, a little deuterium and tritium pellet to the, to, it, it's a pea size, it's very small, but the, the, the ratio is 30 to one. So imagine a basketball being compressed to the size of a pea, that's what that, facility does. And so that pressure, that amount of pressure creates the conditions for fusion. Because they, they smash because they're, they're just, they it's, run out of room. Right, they it's, run out of room. Instead of speeding, they're running out of room. Yes, exactly. So it's, it's very dense, very hot, just a lot of, a lot of pressure in, in, a, in a small space. So they just have to fuse. You're using lightsabers, right? <laughs> 192 <laughs> light. It's 192, 96 lasers pointing at the same time. It's amazing. It's amazing. I, I was actually there like just three days ago, uh, coincidentally. And it just a facility is amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, it better be because we need it. <laughs> In episode two, the alien Faraday vomits from his body a blue cube that is his fusion engine. And I don't think that's where fusion engines are stored. <laughs> but that blue cube spins and becomes a donut that may actually be what fusion engines look like. Yes, actually. And, and, and actually, I know we're talking about this film, but when you look at Iron Man, that donut chip, it's the same reason. It's because magnetic fusion reactors are going to look like donuts, some, some kind of donut. Yes. This big? No. <laughs> no, definitely not this big, but they will look, it, most likely they'll look like donuts. The, the most uh, studied configurations look like donuts. And the reason is when you have a magnetic field, you can control plasma. 
right? So the way it controls it is if you have a magnetic field going like this, the plasma is gonna spin tightly around the magnetic field. It just goes straight in that line. So whereas with the Earth, it's like a big bar magnet and you have the plasma going towards the north and the south. If we, instead of doing, doing it like a bar magnet, what we do is we make a donut that has a magnetic field right in the axis of that donut and we make the hot plasma right in that axis, then we can keep the plasma away from our walls and just heat it up right there in the middle. So it needs to be a donut so but that it doesn't it touch the wall. Doesn't touch the, the wall. plasma doesn't touch the because wall. Because the plasma is very hot. Yeah, oh yes, because yeah. it is 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. Right, right, right. What could we possibly have that would- That could contain it, that, that could contain, contain it. it. Right, I, and I remember one of the, I think episode two, uh, <laughs> she was talking about how she said, oh, there's nothing that could contain the, that, the, those levels of, of temperature. I'm like, yes, yes there is. <laughs> A magnetic field can, in fact, you can keep the plasma, the hottest part of the plasma right in the center without the Krispy Kreme machine, with the Krispy Kreme outer layer, which would be the machine, uh, without it touching the plasma. I really enjoyed this series, except for this one moment when a still grieving Justin Smalls admits to Faraday that she got too eager to test her theory, skirted safety protocols, and killed her husband. And Faraday tells her that if she killed just one person in the creation of fusion energy, that's a pretty good trade. And that sounds like good drama, but bad science. So what are the safety protocols, both, both in the lab currently and, and for the future? Right. If you tell the Department of Energy that we're going to just sacrifice a few people, they'll be like, stop what you're doing right now. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Safety is the, the of utmost concern. And when we are running these machines, uh, safety is the number one thing that we that we're that we're concerned about. Um, really, the main safety is we need a to run a lot of electricity, a lot of current at very high voltages when we're running. Right. That's the main concern. So when we're actually running our device, we lock the the cell, the test cell out completely. Nobody can go in. Nobody can can get to where the high voltages are. Right. Additionally, as I said, we create fusion every day in our lab. So those neutrons, remember those neutrons? Those neutrons come out and activate uh, aluminum and G5, and they 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 actually create for a little while uh, hazardous hazardous environments. So another point of safety is when you're running and you have a particularly energetic run day, uh, there are sensors to make sure that the, the half-life of radiation has gone down enough so that it's not hazardous before anybody can go in. So really those are the main concerns. Um, also there's you know high pressures and tanks and things like that. There's always regulation in how you can and how you're dealing with these things. Do you think the general public is feeling a little bit afraid because of nuclear fission? Well, I hope the general public isn't afraid, but if they are, I do understand how there, there can be some fear because of the connection to fission, right? I, as I've been saying, this is nuclear, right? So we are dealing with radioactive, even though it's qualitatively different. Remember I just said th these little guys, right, tritium? This is, when we're talking about radioactivity, this is what we're talking about, the right. tritium, the tritium in there. It's very low radioactivity. The amount of tritium that you're gonna have at one time within our uh, facilities is much lower than the amount of radioactive material that you have in fission plants at the same time. Because in fission, you need to put all of your material in there at once, right? In fusion, you don't. In fusion, you just need to slowly put in a little bit of deuterium and tritium. If you put in too much, it's just not gonna work. Oh. You have to put in grams at a time of the, of the, the tritium inside your machine. Um, so I, I don't wanna minimize it. Tritium is radioactive. It does uh, create tritiated water, which we have to deal with. Um, when we make our facilities, they have to be treated, there have to be some regulations about it. Um, we believe it's, it wouldn't be to the, to the same uh, as our arduous regulations of the fission because of qualitatively different, but we do have to treat it as something that, that is radioactive. So, 
So I think it's, it, we shouldn't dismiss the fact that we are dealing with reactivity, but we have to be transparent and we have to get the community involved soon. We have to, 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 to socialize that. And I love, I love that we're talking about fusion right now because I want, and our community wants the world to know about fusion, about its promises and about its real safety concerns and make sure that that we are aware of those concerns, right? <laughs> In episode three, the alien Faraday asks Hatch Flood, are you afraid of me? And Hatch, an intellectual property risk assessor by trade, says yes, and then prophesizes that in the first 30 days of the advent of fusion energy, the financial exchanges worldwide will collapse. Nobody has any security from anything. Dogs and cats will battle it out on the streets as an oil-addicted planet goes, goes cold turkey and everyone declares war on the U.S. And Faraday agrees. Once this energy source is in place, nothing will ever be the same. And again, on TV, that's great drama. In real life, drama is not so good. Will nuclear fusion have an actual macroeconomic unbalancing effect on the world? So uh, one thing to point out is that in the series, fusion is practically free. Like they ha they're, they're going to have these devices that automatically are going to generate all of this electricity, right? In reality, to make these machines, it's going to cost a lot of money. Magnets are not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you're... There is, a, and we, as, as a community, we're doing these cost-benefit, especially the private companies. The private companies and, you know, other, other organizations are doing these studies of what do we expect the, the dollar per kilowatt hour to be. Um, and we are seeing that it's going to be competitive with current prices, right? It's not going to be free. But it's also not going to be much more expensive. So we're in a we're in a relatively sweet spot that it's that it's going to be competitive, right? So when you're when you when you're looking at that, it's not it's going to be like bringing new technology, like solar, bringing wind. Solar did not cause cats and dogs to fall off the sky, right? <laughs> the it's going to be a new technology that goes into the market that needs to be developed, that needs to the price to go down because of because of the mass production and all of this, right? Because of competition, all, all of these things are gonna happen, but they are, they're not expected to disrupt the market significantly, but, but they will be a, 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 an alternative energy source that can compete with, with hydrocarbons, mm. that can create baseload power, that is a lot of energy density, so that we can power cities, power industry, um, hopefully in, in, a, in, an ener in, a, in an energy justice sort of way in which we are powering communities that have been marginalized uh, in the past and internationally, right? We, that's up to us, both as scientists, as, as entrepreneurs and as societies to say, this, com this, this energy is coming how are we going to make sure that it's going to be a source of good for the world? In Star Trek, the United Federation of Planets reaches out to new prospective members as soon as that society achieves a warp core drive. But given the weight the utopian societies depicted in Star Trek consume energy like it's never ending, fusion energy might be a more significant turning point in a planet's development. So are we ever going to get any of the things that we dream of, like you know, uh, replicators and frequent space travel, maybe a clean environment without fusion energy or some kind of massive energy source? And so <laughs> this might be a bleak answer. Yes, because, I mean, if we, if we don't develop fusion energy and we don't develop all these alternative energies, we're not going to have a chance as a, as a society to live past a few decades. And that, I, that's where we are with climate change. So we really need to develop fusion and other alternative energies so that we can stand a chance at global warming and the effects that it's going to be. Now, if we're at a point that we can still, you know, we can still live as a society and, and as a human race, then absolutely technology is going to, to, to advance with all of this energy that, that we're gonna get. So, glass half full? <laughs> <laughs> glass half full, or we better do something. We better do something, yeah. absolutely.
Yeah. Unfortunately, we are so out of time. It has been such a pleasure to, to spend time with you. I hope you come back. Yes, I would love to. So listen, while we're talking out, tell me about the lapel on the pin on your lapel. Yes, so this is a, a little lapel pin from um, a site called usfusion usfusionenergy.org, which we've developed in our community with community partners, not only from our lab, but from other fusioneers around the country. Um, and it's actually, it, it is, it's that it's a it's a public facing site where we just where we're talking about fusion about the us's role in it and on how to become a fusioneer either a scientist technologist or anything anybody involved a teacher that wants to talk about plasma and fusion in their classroom we have resources there so yeah absolutely